All right, so we'll do a uh, trivia question. First, of course, what was uh, the name of Solomon? What was Solomon's name that God gave him? I'll clarify that so that it's easier to answer. What was the name that God gave Solomon? And then I'm going to pull out last week's theoretical outline. Let's see. Oh, it looks good, doesn't it? I like it. Um, since we kind of ran out of that, we'll start in afresh. I didn't quite put anything together beforehand for Johnny in, and I kind of missed doing that. So ended up busier this week than what I anticipated. So okay. anybody got the, on the fly? The what? You you do well on the fly. You're good. Well, I appreciate that, but I don't mean to mess you up because you know I. You're putting in a ton of work on trying to call it. Jedediah. Jedediah. Yes, Jedediah. So let's look over at 2 Samuel. And I actually think it works out better that he ended up going by Solomon. 2 Samuel 12, uh, 25 is the actual verse. Um, because, you know, I think Song of Solomon has a certain alliteration to it. And Song of Jedediah would not. And in fact, it may not have made it through to the canon of the Bible just based on the name. So uh, verse 24, David comforted his wife Bathsheba and he went to her and lay with her. She gave birth, birth to a son and they named him Solomon. The Lord loved him. And because the Lord loved him, he sent word through Nathan the prophet to name him Jedidiah. So either Nathan never got there with the name or they kind of disregarded it or who knows what. But I think God wanted him named Jedediah, which is really interesting that God was naming the child. But as we've talked about before, names always mean something. And in this case, Jedediah means loved of the Lord or loved by the Lord. And it's also in Hebrew, it's in extension of the name David. So if you picture a name David being kind of similar, Jedediah, which has similar root terms and as David, is almost like, um, you know, maybe like naming a child, um, maybe a Daniel naming a child uh, Danielle, for instance, as a daughter. I can't think of a good male example suddenly. But anyway, it'd almost be like saying uh, John has a Johnson as a child, the son of John. So, and that used to be kind of common before that became a surname. So, in this case, Jedediah reflects the name David and extends it with this comment that he is loved by the Lord. So, essentially, remember when this happened, David and Bathsheba had sinned. David had had Uriah killed. They had a baby seven days later. He was struck by an illness. Seven days later, he died. The, the baby they had born of their sin. And so then David comforted Bathsheba, went to her. They had another baby of Solomon or Jedediah. And I think God was basically saying, look, I'm still with you. I'm extending your throne through your son with a similar name and a name that means love by the Lord. And it was kind of a reassurance to uh, David, I think, that God still had in mind great plans for David. And indeed, obviously, Jewish and then now and Christian history is uh, full of evidence that God had the same plan through David. All right, so let's go to Job 1. I hope if you had a chance to read Job 1 too, I'm going to read some highlights and we'll talk about some issues. Do you almost say? Yes. Quick question. I'm sorry. I was sure. having an internet issue. Where was it that you were reading that from about Jedediah? Uh, that was in the Bible. Um, that was in uh, 2 Samuel. All of a sudden, I'm forgetting the verse. 1 Samuel. Four, I think. Yeah. Think I was, I was <laughs> looking at it. I mean, good grief. You caught me. 2 uh, Samuel 12, 25. 12, thank you. I was thinking. Thank you. How about 13? You no. Know, well, okay. All right. Second Samuel twelve twenty five. Very good. Okay. So the Thank internet. You. Oh, sure. The emotional internet got the best of us again. All right. So 
I do want to mention that in the family tree of David, there, there are several interesting aspects, um, including the fact that he has one son named two times. And I, uh, let me just clarify that because I think it's interesting when thinking about David. But if you look at First Chronicles 3, it's one of those uh, easy to find chronicles when you start talking about children of somebody. But Eliphalet was named twice. So David reigned, this is uh, First Chronicles 3, and I'll start verse 4 and a half. David reigned in Jerusalem 33 years. These are children born to him there. Shemua, Shobab, Nathan, and Solomon. These four were by Bathsheba, daughter of Amiel. There were also Ibhar, Elishua, Eliphalet, Noga, Nephad, Jephiah, Elishima, Eliada, and Eliphalet. So Eliphalet was named twice. Either he ran out of other names, so it's possible. That's a lot of kids to name. Or there's some sort of typo, or he actually just named two of them Eliphalet. You know, stranger things possibly have happened. Not really sure on that one. Sure. And then um, at chapter 3, verse 1, there's also the mention of Daniel, the son of Abigail. That one also is named Keliab, K-E-L-I-A-B. In some interpretations, versions, translations. So Daniel and Keliab seem to be the same child and nothing else known about them. So anyway, we're over at Job 1. That's my short iteration of some of the oddities of the genealogy of David. In the land of Uz, there lived a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright, and he feared God and shunned evil. He had seven sons and three daughters, and he owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 donkeys, and had a large number of servants. He was the greatest man among all the people of the East. His sons used to take turns holding feasts in their homes, and they would invite the three sisters to eat and drink with them. When a period of fasting had, come, had run its course, Job would send and have them purified. Early in the morning, he would sacrifice a burnt offering for each of them, thinking, perhaps my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. This was Job's regular custom. All right, so why would we need, want, or have that background on Job? Anybody have any particular thoughts about what we now know about Job from five quick verses? He asked for forgiveness for his kids too, not yes. just himself. And he and how did he do that? With by what process? The offerings. Yeah, offerings. an offering of a sacrifice. So what you know, I think what we could reasonably interpret from that, and that's an excellent one to glean from this, is that he essentially served as a priest for his family. What other do we know of other examples of priests for their family? Well, I'll go ahead and answer that. There was, you know, uh, Mephibosheth, or excuse me, not Mephibosheth. Oh, man. Melchizedek. And, sorry, Mephibosheth was the son, Jonathan. So um, there's Melchizedek, there's Abraham, and other what we tend to call the patriarchs, right? Where the, the father figure in the family served his, in the priestly role, following after God and offering sacrifice and providing for his family spiritually. So very clear there. So what would that indicate to us about Job in terms of the timing of when did Job live? Pre Moses. Yeah, before, did you say before Moses? I heard yeah. Moses. yeah, yeah, before the era of the law of Moses, during the patriarchal age, at a time when uh, God seemed to go very directly to leaders of families and express his will for them. Uh, he certainly did with Abraham. He had with Terah, Abraham's father, and he had, um, you know, obviously gone also like, for instance, Adam, and he spoke directly to Cain and he uh, dealt directly with Enoch, take him into heaven. So we're talking about pretty ancient time frame here, right? Almost certainly based on that. Why else would we want to know much about, or what else would help with the dating of Job versus others, maybe? Placing him in that early 
biblical history time frame. Well, I'll answer because this is sort of a weird one to answer, I guess. Although you could, I mean, you could answer in English, I'd understand. But if it, um, if you look at the way that wealth was described, essentially prior to, you know, a certain time frame where there were kings and taxes, maybe even military service and some form of a, a built economy in a land like Canaan, for instance, Prior to that, wealth was almost always expressed by how many servants one had, how many cattle, sheep, goats. That was a real common way to express how wealthy someone was. There's a very similar description of Abraham. I think he had 328 fighting men under him, and that was seen as a sign of wealth. He was essentially his own nation. And so Job was basically a nation in the East. It just in this case happened to be Job the guy who was the patriarch rather than having a defined like borders and land. So when we read about two, you know, he had this large number of servants. There's also the ever helpful line thrown in for us at verse three that says he was the greatest man among all the people of the East. So it's easy to realize that Job was very powerful very significant in history and he also knew to sacrifice to god a burn offering for the children and he used this very interesting term that uh says that, that job would send and this is verse five he would fast or after the feasting excuse me after the feasting had run its course he would send and have them purified Early in the morning, he'd sacrifice a burnt offering for each of them, thinking, perhaps my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. So he acknowledged God, and he did burnt sacrifice, and he asked for purification, or essentially forgiveness. And I think those are all very significant things. This is not what sometimes I think gets, you know, sort of portrayed as just the story of a, of a guy that got picked on to see if he'd you know, curse God. I think he also was the most significant person in the East, follower of God in whatever way he knew to, offerer of sacrifices, understander of the need for purification and forgiveness of sins, and particularly maybe realizing that they, his children should not curse God because there was some sort of eternal or spiritual um, problem with that. You know, they, if they curse God, they would be cursed themselves or maybe put off with Satan into the abyss rather than being rewarded with the presence of God in heaven. So it strikes me that Job knew a lot about a relationship with God. And I just think that's important to lay as the groundwork. I don't think Job was blindsided by all this. I think he knew very well the the process. Excuse me, the process of trying to uh, be pleasing to God. And of course, he had the wealth then. So when we say he was in the East, and when we say in the land of us, where would we kind of tend to think of that as being? Anybody been to us on trip? You need your whiteboard, Norm. That what? I'm sorry? You need your, you need your whiteboard so you can draw a map for us. Yes. That was that would be perfect. That would be fantastic. So we'll have to go with the figurative whiteboard, unfortunately. But this would be, uh, as described, it being the east. So we're talking about east of the Jordan, probably east of some area that kind of encompasses the Gulf, uh, the excuse me, Persian Gulf. So essentially, if you view, however you want to view Eden. What I tend to view is a huge land mass that had a specific area of the Garden of Eden, and we'll talk about that a different time probably in terms of a viewpoint on that. But uh, the land of the east would be essentially east, I believe, of the Tigris, Euphrates, and the area that we generally regard as the Middle East today, Iran, or excuse me, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, going toward Iran and toward the Mesopotamian bit basin that you may have heard about back when you did you know world geography and world civilization so who else was from 
Mesopotamia and that region. Abraham. Abraham, absolutely. From Ur, sound similar to us, Ur of the Chaldeans. They, you know, the, these may have been contemporaries because they're described very similarly. And, you know, Job was a man that followed after God, much like Abram, Abraham did. Abraham ran across Melchizedek, and Melchizedek did serve God, was described as a royal priest. And so uh, I think it's interesting how there seem to be sort of similarities there. The other, if you want a real radical view, there are there actually is a line of thought that there are some people uh, that promote this based on their study. And I don't necessarily fully agree, but I could see their point. And that is that Job may actually have been a contemporary of Adam and that Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden. Job may have been a person in the land of Eden that also dealt with Satan coming with temptation, much like Eve dealt with Satan coming and saying, eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now, I know that's a radical thought, but I'll just throw out the little reminder that Cain, when he was expelled after killing Abel, mm -hmm. went out to build cities for his people. There must have been some other people around, or you don't really dream up building a city when it's only you. Mm -hmm. And so, or at least most people I know haven't done that. And that's... Cain also went east, didn't he? Went yeah. Out. And so this may have been a relatively close descendant maybe you know of Cain and that group of people uh it could have just been other people descending from e Eden or the Garden of Eden or Adam and Eve or other people that possibly God just created in there to populate the earth I wouldn't put that beyond God in any way I think he created Adam first and placed Eve to be his helper and had you know walks with them and went to the garden and such, and he may well have had this other structure of people around in the land that he had created. So anyway, whatever way you want to view it, view it, the real key to me is he knew God, he knew sacrifice, he knew purification, and he was a man of great physical, both wealth and power by that description. So then verse six, one day the angels came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan also came with them. The Lord said, Satan, where have you come from? So this has always been a fascinating statement to me. Why, why did the angels come to present themselves before the Lord? You know, is this a routine? Did they come every day? Was it, you know, Mondays to get the work week started right with the angels? I, You know, it's really a fascinating thing to think about that the angels have to come. And then Satan came with them. Which sort of points out the thought, at, at the very least, as we talked about the last couple of weeks, not only does Satan exist, but Satan, by evidence, scripturally, though sometimes a little obtuse, uh, does show that Satan had some degree of angelic realm background, and that maybe he knew these other angels, maybe he had come and presented himself with the angels before he actually sort of became Satan the deceiver, before he started to try to influence Eve. And so if you think about that way, if you think about Satan being, or the serpent in the garden, it's that's never named as Satan, as we've talked about a few times, that the serpent was there tempting Eve, and he may literally have just accomplished that at some point, relatively short before the story of Job. Or maybe this was a realm where, you know, he, he was just looking for more trouble to cause because he was more crafty than the other beasts of the earth. So whatever way Satan came more. and the Lord said, Satan, where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord from roaming through the earth and going back and forth in it. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my serpent servant? <laughs> Excuse me. That was a slip of the tongue. He was not a serpent as far as I know. Uh, have you considered my servant, Job? There's no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. Very similar in description to the description of Noah, that there is but one righteous man found in the earth, and that was Noah. So, 
you know, it's interesting just the parallels of the era, the description, the language. So that kind of comes down to who wrote Job. And frankly, we all know. We don't think Job wrote it because they're, the way it's described, it never talks about me or I. Um, you know, there's just not really good evidence. Uh, do, do you happen to have any feeling what nationality anybody was that wrote Job? What anybody happen to know from what you've heard? Just curious. Okay, I'll answer that then too. But in uh, there's a lot of uh, fairly uh, linguistic style language that indicates this was a Jewish individual who wrote the book. Most notably that the word God is Yahweh and that that was the Jewish word to refer to God. So there also is quite a bit of debate about a lot of the language about Job, which isn't any surprise if we think about Job as being one of the earliest of all characters in the Bible. And then the Jewish line coming from Abraham, possibly a contemporary where the language was being developed, the language of Eber or the Hebrews in the time of uh, Abraham, there just are a lot of terms and phrases we don't know much about. And so, in fact, to the point that there's there are two lines of translational thought, and one of them is actually 400 lines longer than another because in one translational group, people who study translation and language scholarship, uh, you know, full time, one group believes that there are enough obscure lines that we don't know the meaning of that they've actually just kind of snipped them out, if you will, because there's no way they can interpret them with accuracy. So about 400 lines, I don't know how long they consider a line, but that's, um, it's widely open to interpretation that way. So it's kind of interesting, but it was, this was apparently what we would consider to be Yahweh, the God of all, God Almighty. But in this case, the God of Abraham, who was in conversation with Satan at this, whatever time this was. So does Job fear Yahweh for nothing, verse 9? Or does Job fear God for nothing? Satan replied. Have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? You bless the work of his hand so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land. But stretch your hand out and strike everything he has. And he will surely curse you to your face. So when you think about that hedge around him, you might think about a similar circumstance to being sort of like the Garden of Eden, in a sense, where this was sort of a protected environment that God had for him. And the Lord said to Satan, very well then, everything he has is in your hands, but on the man himself do not lay a finger. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. One day when Job's sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, the oxen were plowing and the donkeys were grazing nearby and the Sabaeans attacked and carried them off. The servants, uh, they put the servants to the sword and I'm the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, the fire of God fell from the sky and burned up the sheep and his servants and I'm the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, the Chaldeans, oh, that's interesting since we're talking about the Ur of the Chaldeans, Ur of the Chaldeans being the home of Abraham, formed three raiding parties and swept down your camels and carried them off. They put the servants to the sword, and I'm the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, yet another messenger came and said, your sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine. At the oldest brother's house, when suddenly a mighty wind swept in from the desert and struck the four corners of the house, it collapsed on them and they are dead. And I'm the only one who has escaped to tell you. At this, Job got up and tore his robe, shaved his head, fell to the ground in worship and said, Naked I came from my mother, mother's womb and naked I'll depart. The Lord gave, the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. In all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. So, of course, this is a pretty famous story, naturally. But uh, And I think we all have a lot of familiarity. I just want to point out from the spiritual warfare standpoint, in my mind, there are a couple of very fascinating keys to this um, 
situation that God allowed for Job. One is nothing happened that is not naturally present on earth. Satan didn't create anything. I think we talked briefly about, you know, when Elijah took on the prophets of Baal at Mount Carmel, that the real key was don't bring fire and let's see who's in charge. And God created fire to consume the entire altar, rocks and all. And the prophets of Baal were unable to cause Baal to be able to create anything. So I think it points out that Satan can use physical calamity and physical circumstances on earth to try to hurt us spiritually, to try to get us to blame God for things that happen to us on earth. So in this case, it was the those dreaded Sabaeans uh, that we really know nothing much else about, except that they're possibly from the area of Sheba. Think about the Queen of Sheba that came to Solomon, modern day Yemen, uh, would be the area that was Sheba. So we're talking about a southward attack from the south, an attack from the south upon the land of Uz where Job had his children. And so then when we skip one and go over to the Chaldeans, the Chaldeans were more from kind of the northeast. So that would be, sorry, Crushium in between. So it'd be a raiding party from the south, a raiding party from the north. And then when we read the second one, the fire of God fell from the sky and burned up the sheep and the servants. So that sounds like lightning, uh, which is, you know, a naturally occurring phenomenon that's known to cause fires on earth and, you know, is a consequence of what God set in place in the atmosphere. But I think Satan can use that atmosphere if he's king of the air, prince of the air, in control of the earth, like we read several verses about last time then that would be logical that a natural storm could wipe them out. And then, of course, the very natural storm sounding thing too is the fourth, when suddenly, verse 19, a mighty wind swept in from the desert and struck the four corners of the house. So what I've heard proposed is that the, the if you had the Chaldeans from the north, the Sabaeans from the south, and then lightning from somewhere that would, uh, come across as a storm off of water that that would logically be from the east because of the Caspian Sea being in that region. Is it Caspian? All of a sudden I'm forgetting. Maybe I'm misquoting myself. Let me take a look at a map that I surely could have drawn if someone didn't meet me to it. Uh, is not the Caspian. I'm sorry, that's further to the north. It is the, uh, people draw these maps, never draw them in the order I want them in. Um, oh yeah, it is, I'm sorry, it is the Caspian Sea. <laughs> All that stress for nothing. All right, and then, um, so the, if the Caspian Sea would have been an area that could have had thunderstorm with the lightning and the, uh, the lighting up of the sheep and the servants by lightning. And then the desert could be the Arabian desert that would be to the west. That would be the separation between the Ur and Uz lands and the land of Canaan. So in other words, they were attacked from the four directions. And while I don't think that that's the only way Satan can think of to attack people, I do think it's very representative of the idea that Satan was using this opportunity when God said, you know, okay, you say I have a hedge around him, go try it out, go attack and see what happens, that he literally came from each direction and trying to destroy him and his viewpoints on God. And I think that's a lesson itself for us that we need to be aware. You know, it's interesting. We were talking about the armor of God last week, Ephesians 6, and none of that indicates that there's only one direction that we would have an attack from. It's, you know, the breastplate, of course, is up front, and the the helmet, and, you know, just being rooted in the Word of God, and in prayer, and to try to stand, and then stand against the whims of Satan, and try to fight off the flaming darts. None of that implies it's one predictable direction, and I think that's a fair lesson for us, that he is attacked from each direction in this uh, process. 
So then, uh, chapter 2, another day the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came with them to present himself before him. And the Lord said, Satan, where have you come from? Satan answered, from roaming through the earth, going back and forth on it. Same type of thing. And we talked before, too, about how God is everywhere, Satan is not. And this is pretty clear statement evidence of that, I believe. So he was roaming the earth. Then the Lord said, Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There's no one like him. He's blameless, upright. Kind of sounds like he's starting the whole thing over. A man who fears God and shuns evil. And he still, here's the newer part, maintains his integrity, though you incited me against him to ruin him with no reason, without any reason. Skin for skin, Satan replied. A man will give all he has for his own life. But stretch out your hand, strike his flesh and bones, and he will surely curse you to your face. The Lord said, Satan, very well then. He's in your hands, but you must spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and afflicted Job with painful sores from the soles of his feet to the top of his head. Job took a piece of broken pottery and scraped himself with it. And of course, we know there that his wife said, are you still holding on to your integrity, curse God and die. And he said, you're talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? In all of this, Job did not sin and what he said. So this, you know, physical calamity to the body, I think, you know, several of you involved in this tonight have had to face physical calamity, uh, I know. And, you know, that is a part of our physical life is that there is physical pain, there is death, there is dismemberment, there is cancer, there's, uh, you know, heart disease, there's on and on, all kinds of physical things. There's COVID, unpredictable virus, it attacks the body in ways we don't even understand. Those things are part of the physical nature of being alive. There's zero evidence that in heaven we'll face any of those. And I think, in fact, it's clear that we won't. And so I think it's interesting that Satan, again, was using earthly things against Job to try to cause him to uh, uh, curse God. And, of course, you know, he apparently, I think, even influenced Job's wife to uh, try to get Job to curse God and die. And I would suggest, you know, what would be the benefit to that? I don't think there is any benefit to be done. I mean, he sure he had terrible sores. He was rubbing with broken pottery. I think that's pretty bad. But compared to realizing the purification process, sacrifice to God, atoning for the sins of his children even, I think it was clear that God uh, was in charge. Satan was trying to upset Job in that process, but Job understood that God was in charge. So I think that teaches uh, spiritual lessons too. And then, of course, just... I think it's important to close out the story in Job 42. So down to, um, I'll just read it. Verse one, uh, Job replied to the Lord, I know you can do all things. No plan of yours can be thwarted. Uh, and then he keeps on going down talking about verse six. Then I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. So Job was turning to God for everything. After the Lord said these things to Job, he said to the others, went and talked to them about how they had uh, give, given trouble there. And then I'll go down to verse uh, 9. Uh, so the Lord accepted Job's prayer. After Job had prayed for his friends, the Lord made him prosperous again and gave him twice as much as he had before. All his brothers and sisters and everyone who had known him, uh, who had known him before, came and ate with him in his house. They comforted and consoled him over all the trouble the Lord had brought upon him, and each one gave him a piece of silver and a gold ring. The Lord blessed the latter part of Job's life more than the first. He had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 donkeys. He also had seven sons and three daughters. We talked about Jemima, Kizia, and Kiran Hepat. Nowhere in all the land were there found women as beautiful as Job's daughters, and their father granted them an inheritance along with their brothers. After this, Job lived 140 years, saw his children and their children to the fourth generation, so he died old and full of years. So he was obviously greatly blessed. Just a small thought on the amount of wealth and the amount of power that he had is if you can just imagine uh, trying to feed 
14,000 sheep or 6,000 camels or a thousand yoke of oxen and a thousand donkeys. I have some experience feeding sons and daughters. We have six sons and two daughters, not as many as Job with seven and three, but they get hungry every day. And that's been an observation of mine for almost 32 years now. And it's interesting to me that uh, not only taking care of his family, but taking care of these, this livestock is an enormous challenge. And I think it, it just speaks to the amount of wealth he had that he was able to maintain that kind of a uh, presence on the earth. And then it's interesting, too, when he talks about the fourth generation, we were talking about David and, you know, the, the curse to David that brought to him by the prophet Nathan when he had um, had the uh, relate, illegal relationship with Bathsheba and caused Uriah's death was that he would be punished to the fourth generation. There's something about that that is uh, indicative of what God expects of his people and their heritage. And, you know, that's sort of a different line of thought. But I think it's fascinating that not only was Satan going to and fro on the earth, allowed to do physical things to Job, to attack him in ways to try to upset him spiritually. But then at the end, it even says that they comforted and consoled him all the, over all the trouble the Lord had brought upon him. You know, and God did allow Satan to present him some choices. He could serve God or not. And that's, I think, very similar to what we have in our spiritual journey is that we have that opportunity to serve God or not. And since we're created in the image of God, I think we yearn for a relationship with God or with Satan because we yearn for the spiritual side of ourselves to be filled. And we will fill it with God or with Satan. And so in this case, Job's the excellent example of the one who filled his yearning with God. What other thoughts on the story of Job or questions? I have a question. What's yes. the, do we know what the time frame is for Job from the beginning of the book to the end? No, not really. We only know that he had, he lived 140 years and that he had seven sons, three daughters twice. And so I'm going to guess, even if they were born a year apart and that's 10 years of birth, that that was probably more like 15 to 20. So I'm guessing that his original wealth, he was around 40-ish to where the kids could be old enough to go out and party potentially sin, maybe 50. And they probably, I mean, it take for me to read chapters three through 41 takes about seven years. And uh, cause it's kind of hard reading. So if you figure though, that he suffered during that time of loss for another 10 years and then went on to enjoy future generations, the second set must have been born somewhere around 50 or 70. So I'm gonna make a final answer of about 40 years. And part of that is, that 40 years also seem, or 40 seem to be very significant to God in terms of laying out plans for his people. And now granted, all those came after Job, almost certainly, 40 days and nights on Sinai, 40 years in the desert, 40 days for Elijah in exile, all those 40s, but it makes sense to me. And he was tempted for 40 days and nights. It just would make sense to me that it was about 40 years of stress and then trial. What else? Charles, did you have a question? I wanted to point out that in chapter two, it uh -huh. says uh, when the second time Satan approaches God, he says, God says to him, and he still maintains his integrity, though you incited me against him. Interesting. Uh, well, I've lost my place. You incited me against him to ruin him without any reason. So it's that is pretty fascinating. Yeah. Did you want to, go ahead and say more if you're about to? I oh, didn't mean it sounds, sounds like that God's actually the one that did it rather than allowing Satan to do it. Well, that was the belief of his family and friends there in 42 that God had, had done this to him. So it is pretty interesting, but I still think the tools of Satan were earthly items. Yeah. So one way or the other, that, it, you know, you have a fair point there. It's very interesting, though, that you said you incited me against him, ruin him without reason. Very interesting. There may be some other readings, ways to, ways to like, you incited me against him. Okay, you is the subject here. You incited me against him to ruin him. If you take out that, 
claws uh, incited, uh, let's see, I don't want to take that out. Uh, if you consider that uh, that uh, me against him can be removed so that you and you incited me against him, in other, oh, how am I trying to say this? I think that can be construed to mean that you incited me to allow you to ruin him. Yeah. Yeah, and I think you're right about that. That last phrase was a good, I think, um, interpretive comment. The My footnote, for what it's worth, which I don't always agree with them, but my footnote says, uh, based on the phrase you inside me, God cannot be stirred up to do everything, or do things, excuse me, God cannot be stirred up to do things against his will, though it is not always clear how, everything that happens is part of his divine purpose. And, you know, that's sort of what you're saying is that God allowed it, though he didn't make it happen against him. He allowed Satan to use Satan's authority against him uh, to try to whittle away his faith response to God. But that that's a very interesting comment. Absolutely. What else? Anything else there? Okay. No other questions? All right. I was just going to make one other um, comment about the the basics that we're talking about, about the existence of Satan and the process where, you know, I think that Satan wouldn't be mentioned in the Bible if Satan didn't exist. And, you know, the story of Job is a very clear one that's obviously about Satan. But I think it's also of interest as soon as I find the verse um, <laughs> that... Jesus himself talked about the process of Satan, and I must be in the wrong chapter. Um, I should have written it down, sorry. I will find it, but it, it's just one more proof verse that Jesus himself talked about Satan being cast down and I mean, probably half of us could quote it, and I need to find it. It is, oh, I'm looking at Luke 9, and Luke 10, yeah. Luke 10, 17, the 72 he had sent out returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. And Jesus replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I've given you authority to trample on saints, scorpions, and overcome all the power of the enemy. It's interesting that we tend to think of those as all kind of evil things, right? Uh, and nothing will harm you. However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. So don't get too carried away with earthly accomplishments, but to be thankful for heaven being ahead of us. But that phrase, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven, obviously also in pitting. Uh, that was, again, Luke 10, 18 in that case. In fitting with the descriptions we read in Ezekiel 28, Revelation 12, about Satan being cast from heaven. Just another point on that. Uh, the, the the Greek there, it says the Satan, which you said first, it means the accuser. But, yep. but the NIV capitalizes it like it's a proper name. Interesting. That is a good point. I do, I mean, my feeling, honestly, on that is that Satan is not so much a proper name as a praising name. And that would be almost, you know, like looking, for instance, uh, the only rough corollary I can think of right now is thinking about the Caesars. You know, a Caesar was a king in Rome that had special powers, and yet the Caesars were differently named. There's, you know, of course, Julius and Augustus and Nero and all the many different ones by names, uh, but they were all Caesars. So if you talk about like Jesus' phrase, render Caesar what is Caesar's, he is probably talking about the specific Caesar of the day, but he also talked about Caesar as the name. And it's almost like the name of Jesus, Jesus being mm -hmm. um, the, uh, sorry, the, pro the personal name of Jesus and then the Christ being the formal title of the messiah the anointed one 
So really, I feel like his name should be referred to as Jesus the Christ, not Jesus Christ. And I think that's very similar to Satan. I think Satan, meaning the accuser and devil, maybe more um, the deceiver, that those two are descriptive of Satan. And I'm not really clear that we know his name. So let me close us out by mentioning the other controversy on that which would be the name Lucifer. I don't think we have covered that yet, but that seems like a logical way to spend 12 seconds here. And so, make sure I'm finding our verse in 14, I believe. Let me make sure that's true. Yeah, Isaiah 14. And this is, a, you know, one of those that I think has been, in my mind at least, a little bit overstated about the name of Satan. So I'll read at Isaiah 14. I'm going to start at uh, verse 3. On the day the Lord gives you relief from suffering and turmoil and cruel bondage, you'll take up this taunt against the king of Babylon. I'll just mention, notice this is talking about the king of Babylon. How the oppressor has come to an end, how his fear has ended. The Lord has broken the rod of the wicked, the scepter of the rulers, the wicked, the scepter of the rulers, which in anger struck down peoples with unceasing blows and in fury subdued nations with relentless aggression. All the lands are rest and peace. They break into singing. Even the pine trees and the cedars of Lebanon exult over you and say, now that you've been laid low, no woodsman comes to cause sin. The grave below is all astir to meet you at your coming. It rouses the spirits of the departed to greet you. All those who were leaders in the world, it makes them rise from their thrones. All those who were kings over the nations, they will all respond. They will say to you, you also have become weak as we are. You have become like us. All your pomp has been brought down to the grave along with the heart noise of your hearts. Maggots are spread out beneath you and worms cover you. <clears throat> Pretty good description of the fall of the king of Babylon, I'd say. How you have fallen from heaven, O morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to the earth, you who once laid low the nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of assembly on the utmost heights of the sacred mountains. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. But you are brought down to the grave, to the depths of the pit. Those who see you stare at you. They ponder your fate. Is this the man who shook the earth and made, made the kingdoms tremble? The man who made the world a desert, who overthrew its cities and would not let his captives go home. All the kings of the nations lie in state, each in his own tomb. But you are cast out of your tomb like a rejected branch. You are covered with the slain, with those pierced by the sword. Those who descend to the stones of the pit, like a corpse trampled underfoot, you will not join them in burial, for you have destroyed your land and killed your people. Now, I'll stop there in the interest of time, but all of that obviously very descriptive of someone who is very egotistically in charge of everything he wanted in the earth, like a king of Babylon, and then everything, when he went about destroying all the peoples he went out to destroy, would rejoice because he was going to die be down the pit, be eaten by maggots and decay and all those uh, unpleasant trees that occur that we don't like to think about with death. But in verse 12, this, how you have fallen from heaven, O morning star, son of the dawn, was interpreted in the Latin Vulgate version of the Bible as the phrase or the name Lucifer. Lucifer meaning morning star. And so some people believe that Isaiah here is like, describing the fall of Satan, which it sounds a lot like. Um, and then I think, though, that this refers to the king of Babylon. And, of course, Babylon is also representative of evil and hell in Revelation. So you could say either way. I think that's a reasonable thing. But that phrase specifically in the Latin Vulgate was assigned the name Lucifer for morning star. And I don't think <laughs> that that was ever meant to be the name of Satan, mm -hmm. per se. I think that was a translational process. I think the morning star was, the morning star is Venus. 
uh, yeah. it's the brightest thing in the heavens, hence the name lucid, you know, as in lucid. It, uh, For it us. Relates to light. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, okay. So that's how it, it's, sorry. <laughs> Nothing. Making fun of us. Oh. Yeah, I was saying if it's lucid, and then we need a fur there. It must be lucid for us. Yeah, so that we'll oh, I see. Yes. Call him Lucifer. Yeah, that's why we shouldn't meet by Zoom any longer than we have to. But anyway, the um, uh, I think it's interesting, though, that some people have latched on to this name Lucifer so much that, you know, if you went probably person to person at, you know, a restaurant or something and said, you know, do you know a name for Satan? They'd probably say, oh, Lucifer. Mm -hmm. It's interesting how much that has sort of become common in society. And I would agree with you, Charles. I think it refers more to probably a phenomenon they were familiar with, the morning star. You know, we're talking about people who gazed at the stars and no navigation. And, uh, you know, you had to know how to go attack your enemy. You had to go find them so you could navigate that way. I don't personally really understand that because I've never studied that and I've never tried it. But you know, those things would be meaningful to people who travel here and there. Babylon's a long ways from the Cedars of Lebanon they sign about. And, you know, I think it all makes sense that he was referring to a literal morning star, not necessarily to Lucifer as Satan. Johnny? Yeah, but it does ring similar to the King of Tyre. Well, it does. Yeah, and I do agree. I mean, talking about the farm from heaven cast down to the earth, laying low the nations, dying even, that you're right that there are clear corollaries. And so I, you know, I'm okay really with anybody. If you want to think about this as yet more evidence of the fall of Satan or the maybe more clearly the influence of Satan on those that are falling away from God and think they're more powerful, that they know right and wrong like God himself. Sounds kind of familiar from the Garden of Eden, the original temptation. But that those people have literally sort of sold out to Satan or the devil or the deceiver or the accuser and said, you know, I'm going to take on God because I think I'm greater than him. Then that's all very reasonable. I just don't think that the name Lucifer is assigned to Satan. I think that I think that was a weird Latin term that got thrown in there later on from any in nobody reading the prophecies of Isaiah during the era of dealing with the king of Babylon and the exile would have known the, the name Lucifer because it was thrown in, boy, would that be about seven, 750, 800 years later. So it's interesting to me that Lucifer is still a big name for Satan, even though it really was sort of more or less kind of randomly placed there. So anyway, for what it's worth, I, I don't think personally that Lucifer is particularly a reliable name for Satan, but I think the deceiver and the accuser are reliable names for Satan, and I think we use the name Satan to mean deceiver or accuser, and uh, specifically maybe accuser and devil meaning the um, deceiver.